I want to welcome everyone to the September uh, meeting of the authority. Uh, the members, uh, staff, guests, thank you all for being here. It's a dreary day uh, uh, in, in Albany, which reminds me that uh, I at least am mindful, knowing the area fairly well, of the people who are in harm's way uh, in the Carolinas. Uh, it's a tough time for those folk, and uh, it's remembering, keeping them in your thoughts. Uh, Maybe, maybe will be helpful for them. Uh, we're in two locations today, um, here in here in Albany, and uh, and we have three members in New York City. We have Wellington Shen, we have Beryl Snyder, and we've got Paul Ellis. It's an unusual uh, occurrence when we have meetings in two locations. Uh, the end of last year, to the contrary, notwithstanding, uh, and and there are special rules that apply to that. Uh, there were reasons to do it this way today. Uh, it is not likely something that we will do uh, often in the future. Um, several, several things to, uh, administrative things to make you aware of. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Elizabeth Berlin, who, uh, who has been the representative of the State Education Department here for a long time, uh, because of the enormity of her responsibilities, has had to uh, ask uh, that she be relieved of those responsibilities here. Uh, the commissioner has done so, uh, and in the process, uh, we are delighted to welcome uh, Joe Gilpers, who is, uh, who is called Joe. You, you're, is your name Joseph? Or, I, mean, I have friends. Joseph. Okay. Joe works. You are Joe. Okay. Uh, and we're looking forward to getting to know you better. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, It, it, it is always difficult for me when, when I am invested, uh, I have feelings about something, uh, to, to be uh, a, appropriately extemporaneous. Um, as, as some of you know, uh, uh, maybe all of you know now, uh, Sandra Shepard uh, has resigned from this board uh, for personal reasons that are, that are health related. Um, uh, she was a 2002 appointee uh, and was appointed by Carl McCall. Uh, and that means that for 16 years, uh, she has, if I counted that correctly, has provided uh, uh, almost unparalleled uh, service to this board. Um, she has been a real thought leader around this table. Uh, so somebody whom I have come to respect, somebody who might, I think to call before the meetings. Um, she thinks very critically. Uh, her questions were always incisive. Sometimes they were surgical. And, uh, and anybody who was on the answer side of one of her questions knows that. And I, and I look quickly at Portia because Sandra uh, <laughs> sent a lot of her questions Portia's way. Uh, a very critical thinker, uh, a, a, a person with a lovely mind, somebody who whose thinking patterns I admired. She was an even better, uh, she was even better at expressing herself. Uh, her questions were always clear. And, and sometimes her follow-on questions uh, were scary. But, but they, they drove us all to do a better job at this table. Uh, and and as, as a direct result, um, she will certainly be missed at this table. I've offered her uh, a, a chance to look at some of the board's work uh, if she chooses to do so in the coming weeks and months uh, as, as she takes care of herself and takes care of, 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 of her relationships with family and friends. Um, she uh, will accept she receives emails. Uh, she is not uh, necessarily responding to all of them, all of them but she's, she's doing the best she can. Uh, I always end comments like this by saying she'll be missed at this table. We wish her well. To the meeting. Uh, you've all had a chance to look at the minutes of 18 July. Those minutes, uh, I thought, captured uh, fairly and accurately uh, a, a transitional meeting for that. And to the extent that uh, you want to uh, offer up any corrections or suggestions for improvement of those minutes, to make them, uh, in, in a sense, clearer than they are, don't necessarily do so. Are there any corrections? Questions about minutes. Hearing none, may I have a motion, please, to approve? Tracy, thank you. Is there a second? Gerard, thank you. Uh, all in favor, please indicate with aye. Aye. Uh, thank you, all in New York. 
Um, to uh, the, the second item on the agenda is the Finance Committee report. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We met yesterday <coughs> in Albany. Um, we first um, adopted the meeting minutes from the July meeting of the Finance Committee. And we advanced, and um, I guess Portia will fill us in a little bit more later or now, whatever is best for her. We uh, um, we approved certain changes to the Finance Committee Charter, and we also recommend that those changes also be, I guess, endorsed today by the full board. Um, I think Portia will be giving a better explanation of it. Um, it was really as a furtherance of the one DASNY policy, right? Then we also heard some discussion on the um, the, um, the financing authorization policy. We didn't vote on it, but we heard the um, the explanation. I guess Porsche will be dealing with that later as well. Um, we then advanced to discuss the uh, the pit bond and the sales tax bond um, offering. After some back and forth and some explanations, um, the finance committee recommends that the full board approve that uh, bond offering. We also advance and discuss a SUNY bond offering, um, which we also recommend be approved. And there's a TELP financing with, with um, thanks very much. Thank you, Porsche. And we recommend that that be approved <coughs> at today's board meeting as well. Um, unless there's any questions, that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Porsche, you're going to sure. walk us through the uh, changes? Sure. Um, behind tab two um, is a, a memo regarding the finance committee charter amendments together with a resolution um, <clears throat> and the finance committee charter in clean and black line form. Um, one of the things that we had indicated to the board was that as we went through the one dozen process, um, that we would be looking at our uh, policies as they affect the board going back and you know ensuring that we make any um, <clears throat> any any changes that are necessary to ensure that um, the policies are consistent um, with the initiatives that we're undertaking in connection with one DASNY. So the Finance Committee Charter amendments that you have before you really clarify the circumstances under which um, additional action by the Finance Committee would be required. Um, they really are, are three instances that are laid out in the amendments. The first is <clears throat> if the not to exceed amount of financing increases. The second would be if the maximum term of the bonds increase. And then the third would be if the security that um, if the security for the proposed debt is lessened um, from what had been described to the board previously. The last issue we did dis we did talk about um, in at some length at the July meeting uh, when we talked about the changes to the financing guidelines because we wanted to ensure that you know we had sort of thought the process all the way through. <clears throat> as far as those changes were concerned. Um, so again, you know, the, this amendment is really intended to be a clarification as to the circumstances under which we would be coming back to the Finance Committee for additional consideration. Any questions? Are there questions for Portia on the proposed amendment? It's uh, behind tab two. <coughs> I'm looking at a black line copy because it's just easier. I, I think the amendments are clear, the proposed amendments are clear. Uh, if there are any more questions, uh, may I have a motion, please, to approve? Tracy, thank you again. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Beryl. Uh, I saw your hand first. Uh, all in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 If there are none opposed, the motion carries unanimously. Second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, also behind tab two <clears throat> is a memo regarding the board financing authorization policy and proposed amendments. Uh, again, this is followed by clean and black lines, the clean and black lines policy. Um, this is a policy that we brought to the finance committee for discussion. Uh, we're also undertaking and, and uh, undertaking discussion here with no. Um, no action before the board at this point in time. We just wanted to make sure that we had come to the board 
um, provided this information <clears throat> and, and sought your um, sought any comments or input that you might have. You know, again, this is another policy, uh, another board policy, where we we wanted to look and ensure that the policy was consistent with the one dozen initiatives that we're undertaking. Um, the changes to this policy uh, fall into, I would say, three broad categories. One are technical changes that are really necessary uh, to conform the policy to the discussions that we've had in connection with one DASNI. So, for example, um, you know, to the extent that there was language in here regarding credit reviews, um, we've made the corresponding change to transaction reviews. Um, <clears throat> there's been discussion um, at, about the point in time um, that we undertake um, certain of the reviews associated with the financings. Um, and the change in the timing of those reviews is reflected in the black line changes here. So for example, um, <clears throat> tax diligence, which had been sought to be, we would seek to complete, substantial, substantially complete tax diligence prior to adoption of documents. We have got back to completing that prior to the mailing of the preliminary official statement. So those kinds of, again, conforming changes are contained here within this um, within these proposed changes. Um, the second change that I bring to the board's attention is we had deleted the section dealing with refundings. Um, <clears throat> the broad refunding authorization um, is really not applicable given the changes that had been made by the federal government in the end of the year in connection with the federal tax reform legislation that uh, eliminated the ability to undertake tax exempt advance refundings. We were really trying to get ahead of the refundings by having this kind of authorization in the policy to the extent that that's really kind of off the table. We didn't think that this was necessary. Um, and then the third change that's in here really has to do with one of the circumstances um, or one of the, the instances where we are able to come to the board for a single approval of a financing. Um, and that specifically has to do with refundings for private clients that are currently in DASNY's portfolio. Uh, we had previously interpreted that language to really cover refundings of DASNY bonds for DASNY, you know, DASNY's clients, DASNY's private clients. We've clarified that language here um, to include both DASNY bonds and non-DASNY bonds, meaning those would be bonds that are issued by, for example, a local development corporation on behalf of a client that is in DASNY's portfolio. We, we wanted to bring this to the board's attention um, and, and have the discussion with you because we recognize that this is not a technical or conforming change, but at the same time, we believe that it is something that's um, consistent with the spirit of the One Jasmine Initiative. We believe that undertaking this change that would allow us to capture both DASNY and non-DASNY bonds in a refunding scenario for a private client in our portfolio and um, make available to them the ability for us to undertake this in a single approval is something that is consistent with um, the one DASNY initiative. And, you know, just kind of taking a step back and thinking about it, you know, these refundings, basically, whether there are bonds or whether there are bonds issued by, by another entity, at the end of the day, you're undertaking the refunding. Um, it's going to save the institution money. It basically will benefit the institution in terms of their financial standing. Um, so we thought that this was an appropriate change. But again, to the extent that it was not a technical or conforming change, we wanted to highlight it and wanted to um, have the opportunity to have the discussion with the board to seek your input. So we're not really asking for any action today. Um, but again, just wanted to, to bring this to your attention with the thought that we would bring this back after receiving your input, we would bring this back to the board, um, <clears throat> hopefully at, at the October meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Portia. Are, are there questions for Portia on the proposed amendments that we will not consider today? If <laughs> 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 um, you have not read the amendments carefully, uh, I, I invite you to do so. Um, they, they represent uh, decisions which we made uh, in, in the in the uh, in the one DASNY uh, financing assessments we, we had, uh, and I think they're fairly clear here. Uh, but take a minute, go over them. 
carefully because because they do represent uh, in some instances they reflect clearly the, the decisions we've made overall but but the language itself is important and I think we need to go over that very carefully uh, does that conclude the finance committee report I think so uh, then we're at uh, the single school <coughs> financing resolutions. Uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, and welcome back from summer. Uh, so we're, we're ready to uh, rock and roll. First, I want to thank and welcome Joseph Gilchrist. We look forward to working very closely with you. Um, and, and welcome your contributions. And I'd like to welcome back Tracy Raleigh. Uh, Tracy is now assumed permanent status. It's like the United Nations. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we, we certainly appreciate the partnership as well with the Department of Health. And look forward to continuing our work. I too would like to say something about Sandra. Um, a little as it's known, Sandra and I worked together more than 25 years ago in the controller's office when we were both senior members of controller H. Carl McCall's cabinet. We, we don't always talk about that. Perhaps we only talked about that one time in my three and a half year tenure here. But what I can say about Sandra in terms of working with her, she has always been a consummate professional, capacious in her knowledge, insights, and experience. And someone, whether or not you agree or disagree with her, always engaging, always engaging. And so um, I, I reflect on the work that I've done with her during that period, and certainly more in, in depth here. And so she will certainly be missed. So, say that for the record as well. Thank you very much, Gerard. I, I <coughs> will appreciate it. Uh, behind tab three is the sales tax revenue bond program, personal income tax revenue bond program single approval credit summary with bond counsel Lori Hall, Esquire Hawkins, Delafield, Robert James, Esquire, Golden Holly James, and Matthew Bergen presented. being asked to authorize the issuance of multiple series of tax exempt and taxable fixed and or variable rate bonds issued at one or more times with a term not to exceed 30 years and an amount not to exceed 2.65 billion dollars under either the sales tax revenue bond program or the personal income tax revenue bond program although we do expect these bonds to be issued under the sales tax revenue bond program the mechanics of the two programs are very similar the major difference is the stream of revenues that secures the bonds either sales tax revenue as opposed to personal income tax revenue. The purpose of the bonds, uh, they're going to be issued for both new money and refunding purposes. And on the new money side, we expect to fund the following programs, capital projects for CUNY, capital projects for the Office of Mental Health, the Office uh, for Persons with Developmental Disabilities, and the Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services. In addition, we will look to fund a variety of capital projects for the MTA, various transportation initiatives for the New York Works transportation infrastructure, funding for state and municipal facilities grants, uh, funding for various other economic development grants, as well as funding for HECAP. The refunding of the certain fixed rate bonds, um, they've been issued under various programs, including but not limited to personal income tax revenue bonds, the CUNY Senior and Community College Facilities Program, the Mental Health Services Facilities Improvement Revenue Pond Program, and SUNY Upstate Community College Facilities Program. The refunding candidates were all issued by either DASNY, ESD, or EFC. The uh, security features, when looking at the sales tax revenue bond program, the bonds will be paid by the semi-annual payments made pursuant to a financing agreement between DASNY and the state, and the bonds are secured by a set aside of one cent or 25% of the state's 4% sales tax to be collected pursuant to statute and deposited in the sales tax revenue bond fund. The current debt service coverage on all outstanding sales tax bonds is 3.7 times. 
Uh, under the personal income tax revenue bond program, the bonds will again be paid by semi-annual payments made pursuant to the financing agreement between the authority and the state. And as we discussed with the recent legislative changes, the bonds are secured by a set aside of 50% of personal income tax revenues collected pursuant to statute and 50% of the receipts of a new employer compensation expense tax with both taxes deposited in the revenue bond fund. The current debt service on all outstanding state personal income tax bonds is 4.9 times. Both programs are expected to be rated AA1, AAA, and AA+. Matt, thank you. Any questions for Matt immediately? Hearing none. Robert, Lori, who's going to start? Uh, well, Matt has done a terrific job of covering not only the financing structure, but a little bit of the legal structure. So I'll try not to repeat too much of what he said and just focus on the salient points here. Um, before you this morning are two supplemental resolutions for your consideration. The first being under the PIT program, uh, pursuant to the general purpose PIT bond resolution that was adopted in 2009. The other being under the sales tax program, uh, pursuant to the sales tax revenue bond resolution that you adopted in 2013. Each of the supplemental resolutions authorizes the issuance of multiple series of bonds to be issued at, at one or more times and a maximum principal amount of up to $2.65 billion. While each supplemental resolution separately authorizes $2.65 billion in bonds, each also expressly provides that the issuance of bonds under one will not only reduce the remaining authorization going forward under that resolution, but will also, without any further action of the board, automatically reduce the remaining principal amount under the other. This means the total combined amount of bonds that the board would be authorizing today is effectively limited to just 2.65 billion. Saying just before 2.65 billion is a little, is limited to. <laughs> um, each of the supplemental resolution provides that the bonds may be issued for any authorized purposes, which is defined for both programs by statute as any purposes for which state supported debt may be issued. As noted earlier, the bonds are expected to be issued for both new money and refunding purposes, and Matt laid out very nicely the new money and refunding expected application, so I won't go over that again, but did want to point out, as Portia did in her presentation on the uh, financing changes, was that because advanced refunding bonds have been eliminated by Congress last December, any refundings under this, these resolutions will be current refundings, which means that the bonds um, to be refunded are currently or will be callable and will be redeemed within 90 days of the date of issuance. The sales tax program was adapted from the PIT program, which has been in place for a very long time now. And the two programs, as Matt highlighted, are, operate very similarly, with the primary difference being the source of revenues available to pay debt service on their respective bonds. Because both programs are intended to be very similar, one modeled after the other, the statutory framework, as well as the bond documents, the governing bond documents, are also very similar. Under the PIT structure, as Matt said, 50% of the personal income tax receipts and 50% of the receipts from the employer compensation expense program, that being the new payroll tax program, are statutorily required to be put into the fund, the revenue bond tax fund, and that money is then used to pay debt service on the, all PIT bonds, not just DASNY's PIT bonds, but the PIT bonds issued by all the authorized issuers. There are four others. In each case, subject to legislative appropriation. Similarly, under sales tax, we've got the 1% of the four cent sales tax and compensating use tax um, required to be deposited in a separate fund and then being used to pay debt service, again, subject to appropriation. With respect to each program, the obligation to pay debt service on the authority's bonds, as well as the mechanics of ensuring that sufficient funds are available to flow through the respective resolutions at the appropriate times, is provided for in separate financing agreements entered into by DASNY and DOB for each of the programs. It is these debt service payments made by the state under the financing agreement, together with amounts held by the trustee, that are pledged as security for the respective bonds. So not only are the general resolution and financing agreements for each of the programs very much the same, so too are the supplemental resolutions that are before you today, and I'm going to let Robert describe those. And so uh, good morning again. Um, thank you for the opportunity. As Matt and Lori uh, 
both so ably stated, the supplemental resolutions before you for consideration each call for the total amount of the bonds to be issued under each respective resolution to reduce the amount of bonds that can be issued under the other resolution and vice versa. Uh, as they also stated, the PIT and sales tax revenue bond programs have very similar mechanics as those uh, similarities extend to the respective supplemental resolutions. And so I'll describe the, the mechanics of those supplemental resolutions together as follows. Uh, pursuant to the supplemental resolutions, the bonds may be issued in one or more series or subseries at one or more times in an aggregate principal amount, as we've discussed, not to exceed $2.65 billion. Although it is anticipated that we'll be issuing these bonds as fixed rate bonds, all or a portion of the bonds may also be issued as variable rate, convertible bonds, capital appreciation bonds, or deferred income bonds. The supplemental resolutions each further provide that all or a portion of the authorized bonds may be sold on a negotiated basis or through competitive bidding and may be consolidated into a single series with any other bonds that are authorized under that respective resolution. As is typical, the supplemental resolutions delegate to various officers of the, officers of the authority the powers, among, other, among others, to designate the series and subseries, if any, of the bonds and to determine the principal amount of the bonds of each series to be issued thereunder, provided, of course, that the aggregate principal amount issued does not exceed $2.65 billion. The principal amount of the bonds to be issued as tax exempt, and the principal amount of the bonds to be issued as taxable bonds, if any. The maturity dates on the bonds, provided that no bond will mature more than 30 dates after its date of issue whether the bonds shall, be, shall bear interest at fixed or variable rates, and the rate or rates at which the bonds will bear interest, provided that the true interest cost of any of the bonds issued as fixed rate bonds and the initial interest rate of any bonds issued as variable rate bonds may not exceed 7.5% per year if issued as tax exempt, or 10% per year if issued as taxable, or, any, or such other rates or rates, rate or rates per year as a resolution of the public authorities control board approving the issuance of the bonds may establish. If the bonds are issued on a negotiated basis, the purchase price to be paid to the under, by the underwriters of the bonds, provided that it's not less than 90% of the principal amount of the bonds issued. If the bonds are issued on a competitive basis, the manner in which the winning bid or bids will be selected and the bonds awarded. The redemption provisions applicable to the bonds, including the redemption dates and prices, which redemption price of any bond subject to redemption at the election or direction of the authority may be equal to a percentage of the principal amount of the bonds to be redeemed, plus the accrued interest thereon, to the date of the redemption, and or may alternatively determined by a formula which is intended to make whole bondholders by, by setting a redemption price based on the expected rate of return to such bondholders. The provisions related to any credit facilities to be entered into in connection with the bonds, and whether any of the bonds will be book entry bonds and the depository for them. The supplemental resolutions also authorize various officers of the authority to prepare and distribute one or more preliminary official statements in connection with the sale of the bonds, prepare, execute, and deliver one or more final official statements to execute and deliver one or more bond purchase agreements if bonds are sold on a negotiated basis, and to circulate one or more notices of sale for the bonds if the bonds are sold on a competitive basis, to execute continuing disclosure agreements to ensure compliance with Rule 15C212, to execute and deliver agreements providing for credit enhancement and liquidity with respect to the bonds, and to execute all other documents and do all things necessary, convenient, or desirable in connection with the sale and issuance of the bonds. The supplemental resolutions further authorize various officers of the authority to enter into one or more agreements with the applicable state agencies, authorities, or other entities in order to affect these transactions. Thank you. Robert, thank you. Are there questions for Lori, Robert, or Matt? Just, just one clarification yeah. on the maturity date. It's 30 years from the March 15th. The outside maturity date is 30 years from the March 15th, next succeeding the date of issuance under both supplemental resolution. Correct. And Robert, the the limit with respect to refunding bonds is 
Can you clarify what that is as well? The limit with respect to refunding bonds. <coughs> It's, yeah, that they won't exceed. They won't exceed the maturity date the of the bonds being bonds refunded. To the 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 That's correct. Um, Donna, thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, again, are there any other questions for the three presenters? Hearing none, may I have a motion, please, to approve the transaction? Adrian, thank you. Is there a second? Beryl, thank you very much. Uh, all in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 As there appear to be none opposed, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you all very much. For thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Behind tap four is the State University of New York Dormitory Facilities Revenue Bonds Single Approval Credit Summary with Bond Council Virginia Wong, Esquire, Nixon, Peabody. Good morning. Good morning. Thank morning. you all for being here. Uh, the board is being asked to adopt the necessary documents to authorize a series of tax incentives or tax bonds to be issued under the SUNY Dormitory Facilities Revenue Bonds Program. Bonds will, <coughs> the bonds will be sold on a negotiated basis with a term not to exceed 30 years and an amount not to exceed $150 million. Bond proceeds will be used to finance various dormitory capital facilities at SUNY campuses throughout the state. And the SUNY Residence Hall Program operates on 25 campuses and serves over 70,000 students on an annual basis. The residence program is a completely self-supporting function of SUNY, generating sufficient revenues to support its operations, annual maintenance, and debt service. This will be the fifth financing under the new SUNY dorms program, which dates back to 2013. It was back in March of 2013 that the state enacted legislation which authorized the new SUNY dorms program, which is supported solely by the rents, fees, and charges of the dorm rentals. Pursuant to this enabling act, SUNY executed an assignment to DASNY of all rights and dormitory facilities revenues. And SUNY is required to immediately deliver such revenues without appropriation to the Commissioner of Taxation and Finance for deposit into the dormitory facilities revenue fund, which is held separate and apart from the state treasury. Monies are used first to pay the debt service on the old SUNY dormitory bonds, which are those issued prior to 2013, and then debt service on bonds issued under the new program to fund repair and replacement funds. Any amounts remaining in the fund after the payment of such purposes is the absolute property of SUNY to fund operations and maintenance of dormitory facilities. Security for, for the bonds will be a second lien on the dormitory rentals deposited into the dormitory facilities revenue fund. Bonds currently outstanding under the old program have the first lien on these revenues. And there is currently 393.7 million outstanding under the old program and 1.263 billion outstanding under the new program. Unlike the old SUNY dorms program, bonds issued under the current program are not a general obligation of SUNY and instead rely exclusively on revenues generated by student rents for the payment of debt service. For the fall of 2017, SUNY's dormitories had an occupancy rate of 96.4% and facilities on SUNY campuses have historically been filled at at or above 95% at the beginning of each fall semester. Room rental income increased over the past year due to higher volume and increases in room rates. And for fiscal year 2018, SUNY dormitory facilities generated total room rental income fees and other charges totaling 564.6 million, which generates a debt service coverage ratio of 1.34 to 1. And lastly, anticipated ratings are AA3 by Moody's and A plus by Fitch. Mr. Chairman. David, thank you. We'll go straight to the legal presentations. Jay, Virginia, who, who starts? Jay. All right. Before you today, for your adoption, a series resolution authorizing up to $150 million to the authority of the state and the Christmas book. Revenue bond must be adopted 
This year's resolution authorizes bonds to be issued to finance new capital expenditures in connection with the SUNY dormitory facilities and to pay costs of issuance for the Series 2018 bonds. This year's resolution delegates to various officers and authorities certain terms of the bonds, including the final maturity period, which shall not be when the 30th of the date of issuance, interest rates to be formed by the bonds, provided that the true interest cost does not exceed 7.5%. Terms of the redemption or purchase and due redemption of the bonds. No debt service reserve fund is expected to be established, and no credit enhancement is expected to be procured for 2018 bonds. Of the series of solution does authorize both the authority to decide the market conditions to table one or both. The series of resolution also authorizes various officers to execute and deliver a preliminary and final official statement, a bond purchase agreement, a continuing disclosure agreement, and all the documents necessary. In connection with the initial issuance of bonds under the general resolution in 2013, the authority entered into two agreements, a financing and development agreement with SUNY and a fund administration agreement with SUNY and the State Commissioner of Taxation and Finance. The financing and development agreement requires SUNY to establish fees and charges for the use and occupancy of the dormitory facilities that are at least sufficient to pay debt service, all debt service due on bonds issued under the general resolution and the prior 1995 resolution, and to pay all expenses for the operation and maintenance of those facilities. The fund administration agreement establishes, among other things, the procedural requirements that govern deposits to the dormitory facilities revenue fund. Bonds issued under the new general resolution are payable solely out of that dormitory facilities revenue fund from the dormitory facilities revenues that are deposited therein. As Dave said, the bonds issued under the general resolution are subordinate in right of payment and security to the bonds issued under the 1995 resolution. Under the general resolution, the authority may only issue additional new money bonds, as is the case here, if the net dormitory facility revenues collected during each of the previous two fiscal years is at least equal to 120% of maximum manual debt service on all bonds outstanding under th this resolution and the prior resolution. Finally, the Series 2018 bonds are proposed to be sold in one or more negotiated sales to a syndicate of underwriters. Each sale will be effectuated through a bond purchase agreement which contains the terms and conditions that are customary in connection with the sale of the authority's bonds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there questions for Virginia, Jay, or David? Hearing none, may I have a motion please to approve the resolution? Wellington, thank you. Is there a second? Oh, John, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't notice. <laughs> Uh, all in favor, please indicate with aye. Uh, aye. As there are none opposed, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you all very much for Thank the presentation. You. Behind tab five is NYSAR Inc. transaction with Portia Lee presenting. Thank you. Uh, behind tab five is a tel financing for NYSARC in the amount of $20 million. Um, as you know, it's the authority of Public Authorities Control Board that tel transactions which exceed $10 million in a 12 month period uh, be brought before both KCB and uh, the authority for approval. There's an attached equipment list. Uh, which identifies various types of information technology and vehicle and transportation and other equipment uh, needs for NYSA. Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions for Portia? May I have a motion then to approve the resolution? Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Is there a second? Adrian, thank you. All in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 The, uh, the uh, motion is approved unanimously. Uh, we uh, go to the Corporate Governance Committee report. Uh, Mr. Johnson. All right. The uh, Governance Committee met yesterday afternoon. And uh, after reviewing the, meeting, the minutes of the March uh, 6th and the May 8th meeting, we adopted those uh, minutes. I'll turn it over to Mike Cusack, who will review the proposed amendments to bylaws and the procurement contract guidelines. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. 
Uh, the first, the first item before the board for consideration is is an amendment to the uh, DASNY bylaws, section three point seven and three point eight. This is a follow up to the discussion with the with the uh, governance committee that occurred on March sixth of two thousand and eighteen, as memorialized in the minutes that are before the members now, and. Um, the main topic of discussion back on March 6 was, was was an amendment to Section 3.7 that would allow um, specific flexibility uh, to to schedule a video conference meeting of this board in instances where inclement weather prevent a member or members from getting to the location where the quorum is gathered and will be gathered for the meeting. But, but the persons who are delayed because of weather can get to one of our other video locations around the state. Uh, so it's a very uh, limited and, and, and narrow set of um, circumstances. And what the uh, proposed amendment would allow is for that board member, if he or she can get to the other location and does wish to participate, it allows the board to allow that participation to occur. Um, Procedurally, what would have to happen is is the uh, uh, the chair and the executive uh, director uh, concur that notice is given to the members impacted uh, by the inclement weather conditions that they may participate through the video conference, uh, the use of video conference equipment. And then second, we have to give all required notice here at uh, our council's office as a board administration matter. All required notice as, as is specified in the open meeting as well. As, as part of the review uh, of this language, we did consult uh, case law and, and reviewed the open meetings law. And we find that uh, from a legal perspective, if the board is, is comfortable with this mechanism, there, there are uh, no legal objections to it, to it going forward. And um, just, just so I can uh, add one more clarification. Also before the board for consideration is an amendment to section 3.8 uh, of the presiding officer provision. In your original packets, we left this in the form that it was in in, in March. After discussion at the governance committee uh, uh, level yesterday, uh, a point brought up by Mr. Ellis uh, that, that we, uh, that we in addition to preserving the secretary as, a, as an optional presider at the meeting, that in the event the office of secretary is vacant or if the secretary is absent or disabled, that the board members gathered uh, shall choose from among the members present a presiding officer to preside at the meeting. So that's the only change, and that's before you in the, in the revised red line that's on the table uh, this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hearing none, uh, may we have a motion, please, uh, to approve the amendment? Uh, is that Paul? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, is there a second? John Gardner, thank you. Um, all in favor, please indicate with a aye. 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 Uh, the motion carries uh, unanimously. Uh, second, the second item before the board for consideration is a, is a is a proposed amendment to the DASNY procurement contract guidelines to add to the definition of professional services a category for cloud computing, hosting, and software as a service, which has an acronym of SAAS in technical jargon. Um, there are a number of reasons that this amendment is is, is uh, being proposed, and, and in the discussion yesterday with the governance uh, uh, committee, we highlighted that the category of services that this is is intended to broadly pick up it falls under the heading of uh, software engineering and related services. So much like under professional services today, we have professional engineers, architects, other licensed professionals. Uh, this would include within that category uh, the, the, the uh, software engineering and related services uh, as, as described. Um, a second point that was uh, raised by uh, Procurement and Construction Division is that the phrase that currently appears in our guidelines for data processing services 
has, has evolved. Uh, while we still do contract for data processing services on occasion, that doesn't pick up a lot of the, uh, uh, the modern uh, uh, services that are available through uh, software engineering professionals. Um, third point um, is, is from the procurement standpoint, uh, putting this under professional services allows the procurement division to, to make qualifications-based selections and not just selections based on price. Price is always considered, but qualifications uh, when dealing with professional services um, are, are the guiding uh, factor of, of consideration. Uh, and, and, and it is believed at, at the uh, procurement level, and we believe from the legal level, that this will protect uh, DASNY from uh, challenges by providing clear clear uh, rules for uh, the participants and procurement opportunities. And one final point, while not formal policy guidance or comptroller's opinion, this approach is consistent with uh, continuing legal education guidance that council's office picked up in a recent uh, seminar where the Office of State Comptroller uh, spoke and recommended uh, that agencies and authorities take this approach uh, for these types of procurements. It's a little bit of noise here. That concludes my report. We recommend it on the legal side, subject to the board and committee's uh, comments. Thank you. Are there any questions? Hearing none, may we have a motion, please, to approve the uh, proposed revisions? John Gardner, thank you. Tracy, thank you for the second. All in favor, please indicate with aye. Aye. Is there an unopposed motion? Carries unanimously. Uh, one, one final thing from the Governor's Committee. Yes, sir. The Governor's Committee did uh, discuss at length yesterday in the second session board self evaluation. Board self evaluation in the years of 2017 and 2018 been distributed to the the balance of the board and the governance committee will address the issue with the results of those uh, studies, uh, questionnaires uh, at the October meeting and be prepared to have an executive discussion with the board in October. Thank you very much, John. It was an important discussion. Any other position? Have another one in October. Uh, then we're at tab seven, uh, which uh, of course, is the report of the president. Thank you. Within your materials, there are two handouts I would like to acknowledge. First, we have provided a copy of DASNY's 2018 annual report. And throughout this report, we share some of DASNY's significant accomplishments in the last fiscal year to illustrate how our internal improvements are adding value to our partnerships in both construction and finance. Second, we have prepared a report highlighting or documenting uh, many of the One DASNY initiatives taking place across the organization. Much of this has already been presented to you over the last year and some change. And this is a reflection of integrating everything in one place uh, to reflect the footprints and the work that has been put into One DASNY initiatives. I encourage all of you to read both pieces as they reaffirm the value of the work and collaboration taking place across DASNY. Now, I would like to present to you a resolution for your consideration to elect additional Assistant Secretaries of DASNY. Over the past several years, several Managing General Counsel who serve in that role have retired. Therefore, we are requesting that you adopt this resolution, adding the following employees as Assistant Secretaries of DASNY. K. M. Edwards, Esquire, Managing General Counsel. Francis P. Lewis, Esquire, Managing General Counsel. Ricardo Solomon, Esquire, Managing General Counsel. And Sarah P. Richards, Esquire, Associate General Counsel. Due to the resignation of Sandra Shepard from the DASNY board, the Office of Secretary is currently vacant. I now recommend the adoption of the resolution. Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Gerard. Are there questions for Gerard? Most of the uh, people who uh, are being proposed as assistant secretaries are people who are known to us. And I think it's clear that they've, they've earned the opportunity to do this work. 
May I have a motion, please, to approve the resolution? John Gardner, thank you. Is there a second? Uh, Beryl, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, all in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 Is there none opposed? The motion carries uh, unanimously. Uh, the, as as uh, as president has mentioned, the office of secretary is now vacant uh, with the resignation of Sandra Shepard. Um, but suffice to say that I'm working on that. Uh, the next item on the agenda comprises the uh, recognition of service uh, to employees. And these are, the, I think, the last two items behind tab 7. Uh, you've all had a chance to read them. I'm not going to read them all into the, everything into the record, but I, I would like to read a few things, as I often like to do. Uh, I hope you'll tolerate it uh, yeah, for a few minutes. Uh, the first is for Deb Debbie Drescher. Uh, whereas Deborah Polinski Drescher joined DASNY on October 24, 1988, as an assistant counsel to the DASNY's Office of General Counsel, and whereas in nearly 30 years of service to DASNY, Ms. Drescher held six positions, each increasing of increasing responsibility, and has served since 2005 as a managing general counsel, and whereas in her many and distinguished years of service, Ms. Drescher served under nine of 11 executive directors, presidents, uh, in DASNY's 74-year history. I'm going to skip a few of these. Whereas in the late 1990s, Ms. Drescher was responsible for establishing the initial legal process framework for numerous New York State capital grant programs administered by DASNY and has since provided legal counsel to DASNY staff and stakeholders through the 20 years of growth of, of these programs. Skip two of them. Whereas in May of 1995, Ms. Drescher was appointed as Assistant Secretary to DASNY and in 1997 began her role as liaison to DASNY's board. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, therefore, be it resolved that DASNY's board pauses to reflect and appreciate the dedication, commitment, leadership, integrity, and management skills Ms. Drescher brought, brought to DASNY uh, during her tenure. Uh, be it further resolved that the board offers its sincerest thanks and best wishes for success to Ms. Dresser in her future endeavors. Uh, we all had a chance to thank Debbie for her work, um, for nearly 30 years of work, uh, at this table, uh, at uh, the last meeting she attended, which I think was the meeting in July. Is that, yeah. is that right? Uh, right. And, and, and she responded in a very kind words about, to, about her work for, for this board and for this authority. Uh, we, will, we will miss her services uh, to, to the board. She was a go-to person for many of us. But uh, we are, we, DASI is very fluid, I'm, I'm learning, at least at this point. And, and we are uh, putting into place uh, people and job responsibilities which are intended to ensure that if somebody of such extraordinary responsibility leaves the DASI staff, that there are people uh, in the wings uh, who can pick up that ball and run with it. And, and that is happening now. So we, we wish staff the best of luck in finding uh, and, and putting into place uh, people who will be here uh, for us as Debbie was. There is a second uh, resolution. Um, uh, this is uh, recognizing, acknowledging with appreciation the service of Charles Abel. Uh, whereas Charles Abel served as a designee representing the New York State Department of uh, Health Commissioner on DASNY's board for the last 10 years. And whereas the advice and counsel of Charles Abel helped DASNY continue as a leading issuer of tax exempt bonds for the healthcare, higher education, and not for profit institutions, and as one of the largest public building construction agencies in the nation. During his service as a designee of the health commissioner, DASNY issued more than $66.3 billion in bonds and expended more than $9.4 billion for full service construction projects to benefit. New Yorkers, whereas Charles Abel used his depth of experience in and knowledge of the health department and health care finance field to provide valuable insight and guidance in the board's deliberations and decision making and committed his expertise and talent to help guide DASNY during a period when its health care finance programs were critical to providing adequate health care across New York <coughs> State. And whereas the probing and insightful questions and comments of Charles Abel regarding health care clients, financial condition, and provision of services, heightened our awareness of critical issues and expanded 
DASDI's ability to serve its clients. Uh, now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Board of the Dormitory Authority hereby acknowledge with deep appreciation the services of Charles Abel to DASDI. Um, I got to know Charlie fairly well at this table. Uh, he, he brought uh, experience, history, and social knowledge, uh, and, and, and questions that mattered to the quality of this board's deliberations. Uh, we will miss Charlie. We have with us Tracy Rowley, who is uh, here as the new designee. Uh, we've had experience with Tracy. Uh, and I am certain that we will enjoy having you at this table, Tracy, as much as we enjoyed having Charlie with us. Um, I did not ask for a vote on the first resolution. I should have. Uh, may I have a motion? Gerard, thank no. you. John, thank you for the second. Um, all in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 None opposed. The motion carries unanimously. Uh, and now the evil resolution. May I have a motion, please, to adopt it? Tracy, thank you very much for that. Is there a second? John Gardner, thank you. All in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 Uh, as they are not opposed, the motion carries unanimously. Thank Sorry. you. On August 10th, DASNY posted approximately 50 financial advisors, underwriters, bond council, and underwriters council in our New York City office to discuss the transformational changes that DASNY has made to our finance and guidelines. These changes affect the independent institutions DASNY serves, including higher education, health care, and other eligible not-for-profit institutions. Thank you for shepherding these important changes to our guidelines, enabling DASNY to authorize the use of security features based on market conditions and practices will provide clarity and certainty to conduit borrowers in the investment grade category. These revised guidelines are consistent in our One DASNY initiative, which I began at the start of my tenure President and CEO of DASNY more than three and a half years ago. They will help us grow our business, effectively manage risk, and increase, increase efficiency. I now turn things over to Portia, who will, use, who will give us a market update. Sure. Uh, behind tab eight are the standard public finance reports. Um, since the last board meeting, we priced and closed sales tax bonds, uh, the interagency council, IAC bonds, and the Montefiore obligated group bonds. Um, quick market update, uh, total new issue supply is currently about a little less than $230 billion year to date. That's down approximately 15% from the same time last year. Uh, total supply for this year is, or I'm sorry, for this week is, uh, Expected to be relatively heavy at about 7.4 billion. Um, municipal bonds reported outflows last week, although um, despite those outflows last week, uh, bond flows had netted more than $9 billion in inflows to the market this year. Um, rates continue to rise. One, 10, and 30 year MMD have increased since the July board meeting by 28. 11 and 21 basis points. Um, just quickly, in terms of the reports um, behind tab eight, uh, you'll see that there is a revised draft staff report. This is the same revised draft staff report that we brought to the members at the July meeting. Um, as you'll recall, the, the changes here were, were relatively modest, really. Um, you know, that we, we made changes to delete language uh, that reflected credit or DASNY opinion, and we also added the general disclaimer language um, as recommended to us by the folks at Squire. Uh, we had had the discussion at the July meeting that we were looking for the board's concurrence at the September meeting, so we wanted to, you know, recirculate that in the same exact uh, revised staff report just to see if there were any further comments. Um, and just give the board an opportunity to uh, to have any kind of further input. Any questions or comments on that revised staff report? Comments on the revised staff report. Just for the record, Portia, I thought that uh, under the recommendation that the new uh, uh, language that you've added, uh, the disclaimer language, is, is very, very clear and, and covers 
what we had to go. Thank you. And, and that was the specific language that came to us as, as recommended by Squire. Okay. Thank you. That appears uh, on the second page of the, of the uh, pro forma uh, transaction summary. Questions for Portia? Then, uh, actually, just one other thing yes. in the handouts is um, is the one dousand chart that we also provided to the members in July. Same chart that we provided in July. Um, this again was a chart that just um, distills down the recommendations to to reflect only those that affected the board in some fashion. Uh, the board has taken action on the items as requested by staff, but we did note um, sort of at the bottom of the chart that there were a few operational changes that we we're undertaking and we had indicated at the time um, that we'd give a brief update and just review with the board those um, those items. So they're really, they're the three that are at the very bottom. Um, and I believe that Kim um, and, and Mike were just going to give a brief update. That's fine. Uh who will start, Mike or Ken? I can start. I break my glasses. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, in terms of the post issuance compliance item, uh, we we are working with public finance, portfolio monitoring, and council with finance office, reviewing the recommendations that came out of the committees. That we can on a bi weekly basis, uh, working with internal groups as well as the council. In terms of the expedited reimbursement of construction funds, we have implemented a streamlining for our clients, such that they no longer have to send in hard copy originals in addition to uh, faxing or mailing their, their signed documents. And we are working with Portia to look through the clients that have open construction funds to determine the best way to approach them, really depending on the particular client's circumstances. Uh, we will determine on a case by case basis the best way to give them the option to expedite having their funds. Many of them do have their investments already laid out in the manner that all of them expect the construction schedule. We expect that they would not want to change that. However, on future assurances, they might want to do something. Questions? I'll give an update on the uh, the tax uh, uh, port tax comment in the third box in the bottom section. Um, this ties in with the policy uh, revisions that Portia reviewed uh, earlier, which we did not vote on. It would be bringing back at the uh, next board meeting. But um, essentially, uh, the changes that are that are suggested are are, are to um, anchor, if you will, the completion of tax diligence and the completion of the TEFRA uh, hearing to the point in time prior to the POS uh, being issued, the preliminary official statement. That is consistent with current practice uh, uh, in the industry and it's consistent with uh, practices that we have in place with the uh, governor's office, which needs to sign off on all uh, uh, TEFRA uh, applications. And uh, so we have no legal objections to it. I'm happy to discuss any uh, comments. Questions from Mike? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. On August 30th, uh, we completed a truly transformational project for Cassidy when the State University of New York's the College of Rockport opened Eagle Hall, a new $24 million residence hall. DASNY delivered this project using design build, a project delivery method we pioneered in the 1970s but have not deployed in many years. This is a huge deal for DASNY, the state, and certainly our future. And we have a pipeline uh, in place. By combining design and construction services in a single contract, we expedited project delivery and provided savings while maintaining a high level of quality. DASNY will be using design build on more SUNY projects and is seeking 
authorization to use it elsewhere. On August 8th, could I? The, the design build process is one that some of us around the table are very familiar with, others maybe are, are not. Uh, it would be great, especially in the context of, of the legal hall uh, uh, work, to get a, a, a better sense of how it was that design build got us to what is deemed to be a better outcome. And, I, and I mean, that's not for you now. It's, 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 okay. But to have somebody come in and sort of describe design build in the context of this project would be great. You can certainly do that. Now, forgive me, I, I hadn't asked you about yeah. that before. I, I just thought of it. Yeah. That would be, if, if I can refer you to when we had um, a full presentation on some of the delivery methods that Steve Paul had presented. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, and we identified design, build, and construction manager at risk as really two of the delivery methods that right. we were going to address. With. We'll come back. And it was a great presentation. We'll come back and talk about this project. But we have to do the context of that project that might be helpful for the board to just get a better feel of how it works. Okay. Do you want a real high level two minute explanation? In addition to what I, I just asked for? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Most of our projects are design bid build. So we have a design phase that starts and ends, and a bidding phase that starts and ends, and a construction phase that start, starts and ends. The thing about design build is the design can be ongoing while construction can start before design ends. So we, we knocked off about a year uh, timeline on this project. And how does it affect the bidding, if at all? It's not a bid type scenario. It's a qualifications based selection. So we select a design build team as if we're selecting an architect based on qualifications, not the cost. Factor. So we put the cost out there of what we want to spend. They come back and provide a value type proposition. It's just the performance them. specs. There's a basic overview. There's like a performance spec for what we, the building is. We do have what we call a bridging document, which we provide to the teams. There's some mandatory requirements in there. Beyond that, they're on their own to come up with a value based uh, proposition for us to spend. Thank you, Steve. Okay. <clears throat> this was thirteen. This was thirteen months. Yeah. Last year, yeah. this time we were talking about this. Well, I know, and I, re I remember. I, I remember the presentation with Paul led uh, uh, on, on design building. He actually walked us through uh, examples of how it might work. I just thought that. We'll, we'll do that yeah. because we, we we have we have another one that we're working on, and we can we can talk about you know, how that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Is, is that the words worth, wives worth, whatever it is? Uh, we're talking about SUNY Papa. Oh, yeah, SUNY Papa. We're very interested to hear about that. SUNY Poly. How about SUNY Poly? Yes. yes. <laughs> about the residence hall. Residence hall. Yeah. It's still really interesting okay. to hear. Um, on August 8th, our 50-year-plus relationship with the City University Construction Fund was celebrated at a special event at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Uh, the City University invited us to present, and together we have one of New York State's most productive construction partnerships to provide design and construction management services to the City University's 24 campuses. I had the opportunity to address those in attendance eager to do business with DASNY and I relay to them how committed DASNY is to efficiency, excellence, and diversity in all of our procurements. Managing Director of Construction, Steve Puro, Senior Director of Opportunity Programs, Mike Clay, and Managing Senior Director of Downstate Construction, Mike Stabulus, were also on hand to help MWBE firms navigate various procurement opportunities. On August 9th, at City and State's Diversity Summit in New York City, I participated in a panel discussion on opportunities for MWBEs. I discussed those with those in attendance how New York State is leading the effort to build capacity for MWBE participation rate on all state contracts. 
DASNY is and continues to be a statewide leader in this important initiative, and we make sure MWBE participation is woven into everything we do. We have proven we can not only meet, but can exceed this goal. I also discussed how MWBEs can pursue business opportunities with DASNY, and we emphasize the importance of, lear of learning our requirements, joining our registry, and identifying procurement opportunities on our newly revamped and more accessible website. Our construction division is wrapping up its annual summer campus improvements projects. These 30 renovations have a combined value of approximately $31 million. DASNY's construction division has truly done an outstanding job yet again for which thousands of students on SUNY campuses across the state will be thankful. Steve will now provide you with an update on the construction division's work. Thank you. Behind tab nine are the three standard construction division reports, the first of which is the construction projects report. Now the photo on that report is of a recently completed aquatics lab at Brooklyn College. Uh, the project scope was to renovate the aquatics lab located in Ingersoll Hall, including inventorying and providing a condition assessment of all existing lab equipment, demolition of existing systems, installation of new equipment, sanitary connections, electrical service, and electrical distribution systems, as well as new HVAC systems, heat exchangers for fish tank water filtration systems, and water purification systems. The budget was $1.1 million. The design consultant was Grand Kriegel Associates from Brooklyn. Design started in February of 2016 and completed in November of 2017. Our general contractor was MJ Electrical Contractors. They began their work in April of 2018 and completed this month, September of 2018. Uh, the Aquatics Lab really focuses in three areas, uh, on environmental impacts on the aquatic environment, behavior, and biology of aquatic organisms and biotechnology in aquaculture. The systems were designed with the intention to provide researchers with flexible use research space for a variety of different types of species and experiments. The project features fully automated and independently monitored aquatic systems as well as fish hatching and cultivation systems. Tank sizes and configurations range from multi-tank rack-mounted systems to larger tank systems for fishery quarantine. All systems were built of heavy-duty non-corrosive materials for long-term use, along with a level of automated integration to allow facility management with minimal resources. On page three are six new additions uh, to our project load including a $6.4 million roof replacement project at Baruch, an $8.9 million roof reconstruction project at Queens College, a $7 million athletic facilities renovation project at John Jay College, $6 million roof replacement project at York, a $6.9 million roof reconstruction project at Medgar Evers College, and a $7 million bathroom renovation project at Sydney New Pulse totaling approximately $42 million in new projects. On page nine are the construction expenditures. Fiscal year to date through 2017, we were at 262. Fiscal year to date for 2018, we're at 216 million. That's a delta of a negative 46 million. And as Gerard mentioned, we finished up uh, most of the SUNY work for the 2018 uh, fall semester. It included four capital projects, a $16 million project at uh, Buffalo State, Fisher Hall, a $15 million project at Plattsburgh, Macomb Hall, uh, as mentioned, a $24 million Eagle Hall project at Brockport, and a $4 million renovation project at Rushton Hall in Kent. 29 of the 30 projects are completed. Uh, we are continuing to work on one bathroom project at Brockport, uh, which should be completed at the end of this week. And uh, as mentioned, the total 
of that activity was 31 million. Currently under construction, there's four capital projects uh, aiming for 2019 fall occupancy. Buffalo State Tower 3 is a $16 million gut renovation project. Whiteface Hall at SUNY Plattsburgh is a $19 million gut renovation project. Uh, Dutch Quad G&H Halls at SUNY Albany is a $31 million gut renovation project. Phase 2 of McKenzie Hall at SUNY Alfred is an $18 million project. And in design, ready to go con to construction at the end of this current school year in May of 2019, we have Tower 2 at Buffalo State, $15 million gut renovation project. A $20 million gut renovation and floor addition on Dale Hall at SUNY New Pulse. Kent Hall, which is a $12 million gut renovation at SUNY Plattsburgh. McKenzie Hall, Phase 3, $18 million gut renovation. Uh, Smith Casey, two towers at SUNY Cortland, which will be renovated with an addition added. And uh, at SUNY Poly, a new 250-bed design build project. That's the SUNY update. Uh, as far as other programs and projects at CODA, we continue to work toward the TCO. There's very little construction uh, contract work remaining. Uh, other than punch lists, uh, we're working mostly on gathering the paperwork for the TCO and providing that to the city department of buildings for the, uh, obtaining the, uh, the occupancy permit. At South Beach Psych Center, uh, project building enclosure is the priority at this point for the $265 million project. The building envelope work continues in the form of brick masonry and and backup. Curtain wall and punch window installation is ongoing. MEP work continues on all floors. The project's approximately 65 days late at this point, beyond our baseline projected date of June 2019. Uh, our executive team, consisting of our CM, uh, OMH, and DASNY, uh, met two weeks ago on site to discuss recovery in the 65 days, looking for a revised schedule from our general contractor later this month. At FIT, the $190 million new building project was advertised for bid in early August. We conducted a pre-bid meeting last Thursday that was very well attended. Uh, bids will be open for the project on October 10th to the new goal. Uh, NYCHA, progress continues on the three scopes of NYCHA work. We, on the security side, 56 projects are complete. 16 projects are in construction. On the appliance side, 30 projects are complete, two are in procurement, and there are three new projects added. And on the quality of life side, two projects are complete, 16 projects are in construction, and the balance are in design. Those NYCHA jobs, did like roof jobs, basically? I remember? Say again? The NYCHA jobs, they were like roof jobs, basically? No, we, we did a scope of about $45 million worth of security work, security right, cameras, the, the cameras, right. installations. Right. Uh, we also bought bought out appliances for a number of the different developments, uh, refrigerators and ranges. And the quality of life projects uh, vary in scope. There's a number of uh, community center upgrade projects, uh, playground and outdoor projects, and uh, a couple of miscellaneous mechanical type projects. Feel like work inside the units, the inside the apartment, individual units or anything, right? Not really much of that at all. Uh, on the Javits Center, uh, this is a project that DASNY is uh, permitting. Our code compliance director, Keith LaPlante, and I were on site last Wednesday, uh, observed heavy construction activity, including the continued drilling of caisson foundations, concrete pier construction, and the offloading of structural steel. Uh, and on Moynihan Station, Keith and I were there last Thursday. We toured the project. Uh, we have site representatives from Tectonic Engineers. Demolition and reconstruction activities continue, as well as the construction of skylights in uh, two major uh, locations. Are we doing that, that new entrance that they spoke about the other day to Penn Station? Is that us? Uh, we are not permitting that at the moment. Uh, we are mostly uh, at the Moynihan Station footprint. Mm -hmm. And I rule there, we're, we're, we're permit, 
We're the permitting agency. We are, we're the permitting agency on both Javits and Morning Hill. We hold no construction or design contracts. Other questions for Steve? I don't know what that means during the day. We sort of take the place of DOB for all uh, intents the, and purposes. No, the Steve? Moynihan project is actually a New York State permitted project, so we are not taking their place there. But Javits, we do that. Javits, yeah. yeah. This job here on the on the cover, Steve, with Brooklyn College. Yeah. That's just a simple bid job, right? Did we need a design or we how did that go down? Well the ASME itself really doesn't do any design work. We hold the contracts <coughs> for the designers. So we, and we bid that out to different yeah, architectural we, firms or engineering firms depending on the scope and again it's not a bid, it's a qualifications based selection. Uh, we either use a term consultant that we've uh, you know, gone through a, a selection process for, or we go through a full s selection depending on the project size. This project was actually started by CUNY. They selected the design consultant. We took the project over and inherited the consultant. And then you review the design plans? Yeah, so they find inconsistencies they, or some issues. Right. They try they, to get them uh, as tight as possible and then then we bid it out. Right. The consultant typically will submit to us design documents at thirty percent design, sixty and hundred. We do reviews of all the trades, mechanical, electrical, structural, architectural, general construction. We provide comments, it iterates back and forth those three times, and that you know, we then deem it ready for bid. And then we bid out the project. And, and it's bid Wix, right? These, That's what no. I was going to ask. It is not bid Wix. Okay. Uh, we have a PLA in place in New York City, Got it. which allows mm -hmm. for any project above $1 million to be bid in a single time GC. And I remember the PLA took a long time to actually get done, but then it finally got done and then it opened up. I remember that now. I'm sorry for not. I'm sorry for forgetting the Wix. So how did we do this this recent project in the 13 months without Wix law compliance? Uh, the SUNY program is the only program we have that is uh, avails itself to any and all delivery methods, design build being one. So there is no Wix world inside of the SUNY program for us. We can use design build, design bid build, we can use CM at risk, we can use bid by invitation. So there is no Wix concept inside the SUNY Residence Hall program. There, 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 there has never been, okay. as far as I know. I'll take your word for it. It's, I, I, may, I, may, I may follow up with a question. You, sh you certainly can. Okay. We like the SUNY program. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there are certain like MBE requirements, WMBE requirements that go. None of that changes across the portfolio. Right. It's just the delivery method that we're allowed to use it's different depending on the customer agency. And SUNY is the most vital. Um, are there additional questions, Jerry? <laughs> well, do we do we, have a, do we have a CM as well on this job? On which job? On like this job, the the, the, the CUNY job, jobs, or do we? We we use CMs, but we typically use them on very large uh, capital projects. The South Beach project, we have a CM. TDX on that project for us, and they bring a bulk of the staff. And the ASME staff on that project is a project manager and a couple of field reps. TDX brings, you know, a trailer full of people uh, because <coughs> we just don't have the resources to cover those large projects. On the smaller SUNY type projects, we typically manage those ourselves without a scale. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Other questions? I had one more point, though. Over the last nine, ten years, we would go to a, I think we went up to the hospital in, in Harlem. We went to the south with the, uh, the courthouse in Staten Island. We really haven't done that in probably, I'm going to say five years or so as a board. If there's, you know, something in the city or somewhere, we could, you know. Well, I Make it I available because it, it was very nice when we did the, 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 the courthouse was very informative. I thought you know. we also went to uh, to, to the advanced uh, science center. Yes, that's what I meant. Uh, it. Right. And we had a lovely dinner by Beryl. Thank you, Beryl. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great dinner.
It was a lovely dinner. <laughs> but, uh, I, but, it's here, but I think that's actually a very good idea to go. I'd love to s actually see what we do. I think it would really help the board focus on what's important. Dinner aside. <laughs> we'll buy some hot dogs outside. Right, right. right. Might, might we ask them to you all arrange to get us all together or something? Sure. Some three days and uh, see what works best for the board. Sure. Thank you very much, Steve. Mm -hmm. Good uh, Unless there's some objection uh, from the members, I'd like to change the order of the last uh, two uh, reports. Uh, and go directly to the finance report now, saving the general counsel's report uh, all of that for the end. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Just a brief summary of the information that you provided in your materials. We did have two private client financings that closed during July. We continue to see our support of our public clients. Uh, we are at 94% versus our budget of 92. And in terms of our operating expenditures overall, we are in the budget to date through July. In terms of our reserve funds, we did have some disbursements primarily out of the evolution fund. And that was in support of what the squire from Fox has been doing with the one gas initiative. We that and thank you. Other questions? Not hearing no questions, we will go uh, to the last item on the agenda now, the general counsel. I'd like to give one update. Uh, some board members have contacted me about this as well uh, to an amendment to SEC Rule 15C212 that we're working on. Uh, it adds to required disclosure events to the list of required events. Uh, the first of which is the incurrence of a financial obligation if material or covenants events of default or remedies if material. And the second of which is required disclosure for any default event of acceleration, termination event, modification or terms of other similar events under a financial obligation of, of the obligated party if such event reflects financial difficulties. Uh, the, the, the language that the SEC adopted is identical to the proposed language that was uh, originally released in 2017. So this goes back uh, goes back a ways. But uh, there were there was um, a lot of uh, uh, discussion at the uh, comment level on what financial obligation meant and did not mean. And as a result, the SEC uh, backed off of its original proposal and uh, tried to get that down to a level that was uh, manageable or considered manageable by uh, uh, staff from a number of uh, perspectives. The original proposal was very broad. It went far beyond private placements, which is what they were, what they were really concerned with, private placements and, and other things that do not require an official statement. Um, and it included um, all kinds of uh, other debt, including leases, derivative instruments, guarantees, and monetary obligations, even under a judicial, administrative, or arbitration proceeding holding. Uh, so the SEC has backed off that original definition, and, but they're making it clear that they want disclosure to cover any obligation that acts like debt. So, for example, uh, if the term, uh, even though the term lease was taken out, um, they expect that if it's a lease purchase or a certificate of uh, a participation that's the equivalent uh, of occurring debt, that that be uh, disclosed. Um, the new ruling does not defer to state law for a definition of debt. If they're trying to, stand, to establish a uniform standard across the country. Uh, and I think that the, the thing that, that we can say at this point is this is very much uh, under review by the public finance community and the legal community. The compliance date for the 2018 amendments will be February 27th, 2018. During that time, and during the time right now, we are meeting with our, our various uh, bond council who, who uh, help us on disclosure uh, issues and, 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 and are our trusted advisors in, in this area. We're reviewing the internal disclosure procedures. 
and we may be updating those disclosure processes to to cover anything that's uh, new and I just want to point out one other thing that the 2018 amendments do not impact DASNY's earlier determination to allocate in the CDA disclosure responsibility under Rule 15C through 12 to the borrower in a private client true conduit transaction as we discussed as part of uh, one DASNY. Um, our review will be continuing and we will be providing an update to the board, Portia, me, Ricardo, uh, everyone else that's on the team in advance of the February 27th, 2018 compliance date. We have, we have a little bit of work to do here and we're in the midst of it now, but since it's been public, we wanted to give this uh, short report. Thank you. 19, Michael, right? 2019. Excuse me, 19. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. It's all right. And I can't believe I'm saying 19 already. Yeah. It's happening. It's good. Uh, any questions for Mike at this time? We will have questions, I'm sure, in the coming weeks. Uh, hearing none, the second part of Mike's report is one that lends itself to a closed session. So, may I have a motion to go into executive session to discuss proposed pending or current litigation in the employment history of persons or matters leading to the appointment, employment, promotion, demotion, discipline, suspension, dismissal, or removal of particular persons. May I have that motion? Th thank you, Paul. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Adrian. All in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 Motion carries and you're going to take it. Uh, we just left an executive session during which no decisions were made other than to return uh, to the public session. Uh, are there questions uh, uh, from any of the members about anything before we adjourn? Uh, Paul? Uh, yes, uh, uh, again, Gerard, uh, uh, I was curious about the August 10 meeting uh, that you had with the uh, institutions and generally what the, what the feedback is in the community as to the changes in the financing guidelines. The feedback, with one word, was phenomenal. Um, it was well received, and you know people turned out. I mean, people turned out in the sleepy days of hot August to to really hear from Portia, myself, and Ricardo, and were delighted by what we have collaboratively done. Um, this is reflective of a lot of the work that we had signaled to them a number of years ago with the first set of changes in financing guidelines. We had indicated as we had gone out and talked to clients that we wanted to do more, that we heard the concerns, the criticisms, and we were working with underwriters, FAs, and legal counsel to, to really create um, a set of policies and procedures that would offer the clarity that they were looking for and the certainty. It was well received. I mean, I, I could go on and on, but it, it was real simple and straightforward. People came in and they said, you know, we've been waiting for this. We're excited. We want to work with you. And we're talking to our clients. That, that's, that's the basic aspect. We are talking to our clients so that they can begin to think about how to come back to desk. I mean, Portia, you wanna add anything? No, absolutely. It was a great opportunity to talk to the underwriters, <coughs> financial advisors, bond counsel, underwriter counsel, because you know they, they all are interfacing and interacting with the same borrowers that we're interacting with. Um, so as George said, it was, it was a great event, and you know I think George had asked us to put together a list now of folks on the client side, um, so that he can start um, start up a series of meetings with the with the borrowers as well. All right, that that's great to hear. Thank you for that. Thank you, thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you, George. Is there any other business to come before this meeting? We will gather here on the tenth of October. For our next meeting here in Hobart. Look forward to seeing you all. May I have a motion, please, to uh, adjourn? Gerard, thank you very much. Second? John Gardner, thank you. All in favor, please indicate with aye. 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 We stand adjourned. Thank you.